<clears throat> very glad to see you all here tonight. It's an indication that you showed extremely good judgment how you spend your time. And, uh, but you must be patient. Before the great moment uh, when I introduced Doris Goodwin, uh, before that moment comes, you're going to have to uh, look at a film. Not bad. Uh, it's from the American experience. But that is trying to settle your nerves and give you a sense of preparation. <laughs> Where does the film come? We have to run it, right? Hmm? Ah, I hear music. seems like one of the lowest points for Roosevelt. Public opinion itself was so incredibly confused. And when public opinion was confused, Roosevelt himself lost his moorings. His genius was that he somehow could divine where the country was and help push it along, maybe a little ahead of itself, but he saw where the country was heading. In this period of time, the country seemed to be in such a maze of contradictions that he looked out almost as if he were staring into a fog himself. Eleanor Roosevelt was also at a crossroads. No one had fought harder for her husband's New Deal, but now his priorities had changed. She had had this wonderful decade of a partnership with her husband where they were both moving towards social reform and the New Deal was the center of their hearts. Now suddenly she sees him totally preoccupied by war. When she comes back from her travels around the country, he doesn't really have time to talk to her anymore. My grandmother felt herself a little bit off to the side less useful, um, with less reason to go and be with him uh, as she always was early in the morning or at the end of the day. So this relationship from which she drew strength and a position no longer existed. All through 1941, the pressures on Roosevelt mounted. On one side of the globe, Japan threatened to spread its empire throughout the Pacific. They hate us, Roosevelt said. Sooner or later, they'll come after us. And across the Atlantic, Roosevelt increasingly feared for Great Britain's survival. Some people think that this great master politician was always on top of things, but he had to move in relation to public opinion. That was a major thing. It really got to him. He went to bed for 10 days uh, out of exasperation of the, uh, from the pressures on both sides to intervene or not to intervene. Uh, and Britain was going down the tube. Britain goes down, Roosevelt said, all of us in all the Americas would be living at the point of a gun. Then in early August, determined to do more for the British, Roosevelt headed out to sea for a secret rendezvous in U-boat infested waters. Under cover of darkness, he slipped away from reporters, boarded an American warship, and headed north to meet the British battleship, the Prince of Wales. On board was Winston Churchill. The course of the war would be determined by the convergence of these two extraordinary personalities. I was told, it's a deathly secret, that this meeting was going to happen. It was perfectly clear to my father, and perhaps also to the president, that of course it did matter very much whether they would see eye to eye. 
Churchill, his bodyguard later reported, was as excited as a schoolboy. At stake, the prime minister believed, was the fate of Western civilization. The president was also on edge. He was not used to sharing the stage with any man, and Churchill was already a legend. A Roosevelt aide who knew both men worried about a clash of prima donnas. With the Navy band playing the Stars and Stripes forever, Churchill came aboard the American ship. At last, Roosevelt said, we've gotten together. They talked for four days. Two titanic egos, each taking the other's measure. Churchill was determined to bind the Americans ever more firmly to the British cause. Roosevelt was wary. He was unwilling to ask Congress for a declaration of war without the rock-solid support of the American people. But he was searching for some way to help Great Britain before it was too late. What Churchill needed to do was to convince Roosevelt that Britain was not going to give up. And what Roosevelt was saying to Churchill was, I understand what your needs are. I understand the importance of the danger to us, both of us from Adolf Hitler, and we're gonna to stand together against this uh, monster. Him 540. On Sunday, Roosevelt was carried on board the British battleship for a morning service. If nothing else had happened while we were here, Roosevelt told an aide, that joint service would have cemented us. The, the ship's companies all mixed up and sharing the hymn sheets and everything and it really did seem rather wonderful and very moving. My father sat with the president. I mean normally he would have stood during such a service but he and the president sat and everybody else stood on the quarter deck. My father chose the hymns very carefully, his favorites. The same language, the same hymns, Churchill said later. It was a great hour to live. It was sort of like a beam of brilliant sunshine, like a genuine ray of hope. And of course, now it's, um, I find anguishing looking at those photographs because three months later, the Prince of Wales was under the waves with its entire ship's company. As the two men parted, a message flashed from the British battleship to the American cruiser. God bless the President and the people of the United States. to the real joy of this evening, and that is listening to Doris Kearns Goodwin. There are good historians in the world, and there are good writers in the world, but she combines both a strong, wonderfully intelligent historical sense with, as we all know, really great writing skill. We've learned that from our earlier books, and we have learned <clears throat> that particularly from her recent book on Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor and the war years. I was <clears throat> there in those years. In <clears throat> 1941, I was put in charge of price control and rationing for a while. I had price control more durably. In the 
years of the war experience. My life has been downhill now in terms of power <laughs> for the last 53 years. And so, <clears throat> reading Doris Kearns, I felt I was reading from a first-hand view. I had that sense. And with that introduction of this absolutely wonderful writer, and this superb historian, I'm going very reluctantly uh, I've been teaching now for 60 years, and I can't stop short of 40, 55 minutes. <laughs> I'm going very reluctantly to uh, turn the evening over to her, and then a little later to you uh, for questions. Uh, <clears throat> I'm instructed in the great tradition of the Kennedy Forum to ask you when your turn comes to ask questions and not make a speech of the same <laughs> length as the speaker of the evening. Uh, this is the great tragedy, <coughs> that this happens is the great tragedy of this institution. And we're, we're going to uh, plead with you, uh, much as it is against the instinct of questioners, to uh, ask questions. Doris? Please. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I thank you so much. And what a great pleasure to be able, after six long years of writing this book, embarrassingly, it took me more years to write the book than it took the war to be fought. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be able to talk about it rather than to just sit in my study and think about it. You know, just seeing the film reminds me of why I was so drawn to this subject in the first place. For it was truly, as Ken suggests, a remarkable era, peopled by an extraordinary cast of characters. And beyond Franklin Roosevelt and Churchill, whom we see here, and Eleanor Roosevelt, I discovered there was this whole group of people actually living in the family quarters of the White House, almost making the White House a residential hotel. I kept imagining what it would have been like at night to walk down the corridor of that second family floor quarters and see not only Churchill, who would move in for three or four weeks at a time. When he came to the White House, he brought his stewards, his valets, his boxes with him. He took long naps in the afternoon so he could stay up until 2 AM, drinking, smoking his cigars. He would so entirely exhaust the White House staff that after he left, they would have to sleep for 72 hours straight. He started drinking his scotch early in the morning. He had sherry throughout the day. He had whiskey in the afternoon, 90-year-old brandy all night long, and still was able somehow to save England in the process. <laughs> now, so so he's staying in this special room, the Queen's bedroom. And then across from him is Roosevelt's favorite advisor, Harry Hopkin, mentioned in the film, who really was his closest friend. And Roosevelt wanted him living there so that they could have every possible moment together. Roosevelt was a lonely man and always wanted people around him whenever possible. Eleanor, too, was lonely. So she had her closest friend, Lorena Hickok, living right next door to her bedroom full time during this period of time. Roosevelt had his secretary and really, as many people called her, his other wife, living right above his bedroom. And then the daughter, Anna, came in. Roosevelt's and Eleanor's friend, Joe Lash, floated in. I mean, it really seemed to me sometimes when they met in the corridors, I wondered which one they wanted to talk to more because there was such a stimulating group of characters. The interesting thing was, though, the more I thought about it, it wasn't simply, in Roosevelt's case, a sense of his being lonely, although I think sometimes that's a temperamental trait of politicians. I know when I was 23 years old and worked for Lyndon Johnson, he would like me to sit outside his room when he took a nap, just so he'd know the moment he wakened that somebody was there. Or he would often awake me at 5.30 in the morning, because he couldn't stand the thought of not having someone to talk to every moment of the day. But I think in Roosevelt's case, the reason for this extended family living so close to him in the White House was that because he was a paraplegic, there was no other way he could unburden and relax and replenish himself than talk. Talk was his great enterprise in many ways. He couldn't go to the theater easily. He couldn't go to the movies. Movies were held right in the White House. He couldn't go out to a restaurant. So gossip and intrigue and conversation and friendship was really what kept him able to unburden himself from the, from the presidency itself. I, you know, I think, and I'm sure Ken probably remembers this, but what so astonished me when I looked into this period of time was the realization that though the people who lived and worked with him in this extended family quarters in the White House fully understood the extent of his disability, the fact that he couldn't even get out of bed in the morning without being helped into a wheelchair by his valet and would often have to be carried from place to place, 
the unspoken code of honor that existed on the part of the press at that time was so strong that not a single picture of Roosevelt was ever taken in his wheelchair, with his braces on, being carried from one place to another. In fact, at the 1936 Democratic Convention, Roosevelt was actually being helped down the aisle. He couldn't really walk, but if his braces were locked in place, he could lean on the arms of two strong people and appear to be maneuvering down an aisle. At that particular convention, he reached over to shake the hand of somebody he fell, his braces unlocked, his speech sprawled all out all over the floor. Somehow the Secret Service got him back on his feet, relocked his braces, and they got him up to the podium. And he delivered what may be one of his great speeches, the Rendezvous with Destiny speech. And the incredible thing is the press the next day never once reported the fall. There was never a picture of him sprawled on the ground. Think of how different that is from today when we had to see poor President Bush being sick in Japan over and over again. Or I remember poor Jerry Ford, who turned out to be one of the more athletic presidents of our time, but he happened to fall down the plane steps in full view of the newsreel. So we saw that over and over. Every time I go down a plane step, I think of Jerry Ford. There's a difference in the whole unspoken code and also a space that was allowed a president at that time that is not present today. When you think about what the press would have done with those crazy set of relationships in the White House that existed at that time with everybody living on top of one another and having romantic and intriguing kind of relationships with one another. And yet I talked to an old reporter from that time and they said something like standards were really different in those days unless the private behavior of our politicians had an impact on their public life it wasn't any of our business to report it to the country at large. And then he said with sort of a smile, he said, and besides, we knew we weren't angels ourselves, so who was it of us to judge other people? And I think about that extended family in the White House and how critical it was to provide both Eleanor and Franklin in many ways with the untended needs that they couldn't provide for one another. Because of her discovery way back in 1918 that Franklin was having an affair with a young woman named Lucy Mercer, Ever after that, there were parts of their marriage that they couldn't fill for one another. So he needed Missy LaHand. He needed also this woman, Princess Martha, who also lived in the White House. Her son is now the King of Norway during the war. He needed these people, and she needed Lorena Hickok and Joe Lash. They understood that it was unconventional, and thank goodness we lived at a time when the press understood that as well. Indeed, I think there was a, a dignity to the office of the presidency at that time that was preserved by the president as well as by the press. Roosevelt had this instinctive understanding that I think our current president does not have today of being aware of the importance of not overexposing himself to the public. He knew that his fireside chats, which I thought he had every week. Somehow, when you look back at that period of time, I'd always heard about those fireside chats. But in fact, they were only three or four times a year because he understood that when he spoke to the public at large, he wanted it to be a dramatic moment. He wanted it to be important. And so as a result of that, 80% of the adult radio audience would listen to those fireside chats. And in fact, there's a fabulous me memoir by Saul Bellow recently where he talks about listening to one of Roosevelt's chats in the summer of 43 in a hot summer night in Chicago. And Bellow says he's walking down the street. Every single car is pulled over to the curb, has the radio on, the chat is on. Every house has it on. And it's a hot night, so you can hear it coming out of the windows. And you watch the people in their living rooms and kitchens. And he said you could walk down the street and not miss a single word of this fireside chat because the whole country was listening. And he said the magic was not simply Roosevelt's voice, but it was also the fact that you knew that everyone else was listening, so you felt this mysterious connection to your fellow Americans. And I think whenever a president's able to do that, that's what the magic of the presidency is. But you can't do that too often, or it loses its magic. In fact, one of Roosevelt's famous speeches was called this MAP speech in, in February of 42. He knew the country was at its lowest ebb of morale because everything in the war was going badly. So he decided to give a fireside chat. And he asked everyone in the country to get a map so they could spread it before them as they listened to him speak. So there was this great report in the New York Times saying that there was a run on maps all over the country. Every single store sold out. And they quoted the manager from C.S. Hammonds in New York saying he had never sold so many maps in his entire life. And then he had this great comment. He said, I've been doing this for 40 years. And for the first time in my 40-year marriage, my wife asked me to bring a map home. She hates maps. <laughs> I keep wondering what kind of a marriage these poor schlaps had if, he, if he's been in maps. But anyway, everybody sits there listening to the maps, watching, listening to Roosevelt, going over the maps. He goes through a very sober explanation of why the war is going so badly. But then he, he knew history so much and believed in American democracy so fully 
that he calls on the American I people to believe right. somehow pen. that it was all going to work out all right oh. because he remembered what happened with the winters at Valley Forge. He remembered the pioneers going over the Rockies. It was such a stirring speech that at the end, the White House is deluged with telegrams saying, you've got to do it every day. It's the only way morale can stay in place. And he answered so intuitively, I think, and smartly. He said, if my speeches ever become routine, they will lose their effectiveness. So he knew to hold himself back, which I'm afraid in our political culture today, which is one where everybody tells everything about themselves on Oprah Winfrey, Phil Donahue, in the presidency itself, that sense of distance and reserve has been destroyed, something Roosevelt so instinctively understood. So I think about the two of them, Eleanor and Franklin in the White House, with all these surrounding characters with them, and think what an extraordinary partnership it was. I think unparalleled in many ways um, until perhaps our present day, although the more I think of Eleanor, she really outdid even the current day Hillary Clinton in terms of her indefatigable energy and the things that she did in the White House. The first first lady to hold press conferences, in fact, she had this marvelous ritual that only female reporters could come to her press conferences. Well, that meant that every newspaper in the country had to hire a woman reporter, often the first woman reporter, since they weren't too happy about doing that at the time. She was the first first lady to write a column, which she did incomprehensibly to me six days a week, never missing a single column except the day that he died in April of 45, the first to testify before a congressional committee, and to be recognized in poll after poll as the most influential and respected woman of her age. Her story still amazes me, all the more so when I think about the kind of childhood that she endured, which really was one of economic privilege, but almost nothing else in the way of dependable love. Her father was an alcoholic, whom she remembers very fondly, but the story she tells suggests the kind of undependability that she had grown used to. She tells a story in her memoir of going to the Knickerbocker Club with her father, and they were taking their two dogs, and he asked her to wait outside on the stoop. She waited for two hours, four hours, six hours, eight hours later, he finally was carried out dead drunk, and she had to be escorted home by the doorman. And then her mother, incomprehensibly to me, was a woman so beautiful that beauty was almost like the currency of the realm for the mother. And she somehow told Eleanor, from the time Eleanor was a tiny child, that she was an ugly little girl. And as a result, Eleanor never felt a sense of confidence in the most important currency in the household at that time, and remembers almost as her presiding childhood memory standing outside the parlor while her mother held her two handsome younger brothers on her lap with the fire going, and Eleanor felt unwelcomed into this room because somehow she would make it less pretty by her own appearance. Now somehow you add on top of that this catastrophic discovery after she's married for 12 years to FDR that he's having an affair with a beautiful young woman, Lucy Mercer. She later said that the bottom dropped out of her world. But in many ways, the affair reconstituted their marriage. It was really <coughs> the last thing he wanted to end their marriage. I'm convinced he loved her. Um, I know that he knew his political career would be destroyed if he got a divorce at that time. And good old Sarah Roosevelt, his mother, threatened to disinherit him if he got a divorce. So luckily for the country, Eleanor and Franklin decided to stay together. He promised never to see Lucy again. But what happened is the affair allowed her, I believe, to go outside the marriage to find fulfillment, something not very many women in 1918 were able to do. She had never found it easy having a children and being in a family life because she had never known parenting as a child. His mother never let her have the freedom to be with her own children. She supposedly very generously, the mother-in-law, bought two townhouses in New York when Eleanor and Franklin got married, but it happened they were right next door to one another. One was hers, one was theirs, and a door swung in between on every level. And she never let Eleanor have the freedom to bring up her children on her own. So Eleanor had never really gotten a sense of confidence in being a wife and a mother. This affair happened, and then she went outside the house to find a certain sense of fulfillment. And it turned out that she became involved with a whole series of women in the League of Women Voters, up arguing for child labor. She became aware that she had a whole range of talent she'd never known she had before for public speaking, for organizing, for fighting for causes. And very, very gradually, somehow, her confidence began to build slowly. And then three years after her venture into this outer world, in 1921, Roosevelt contracted polio, and then he desperately needed Eleanor's political skills because he spent month after month in Warm Springs, Georgia, trying to walk again, though unsuccessful. He did this for four or five years, and he needed Eleanor to keep his political hopes and ambitions alive in New York State, which she did brilliantly by going from one function to another and keeping his name alive. And then when he was elected governor and eventually president, her travels for him multiplied. She became, as he said, his eyes and his ears. 
traveling America during the Depression almost 200 or 250 days a year. She was on the road so much, in fact, there was a headline in a Washington paper, Eleanor spends night in White House, explanation point, and she would show up everywhere. I mean, I'm sure many of you remember the famous New Yorker cartoon where the miner looks up and there's Eleanor. There's a great story of a migrant worker who lived alone in a hut in the middle of a muddy field. Eleanor treks across the field a half a mile. He opens the door and he says, oh, Mrs. Roosevelt, you've come to see me, as if it's perfectly natural that she should be there. <laughs> But somehow, through her travels to the CCC camps, the NYA camps, to the Southern blacks, she brought Roosevelt an awareness of what the people were feeling and thinking that he never would have gotten as president, insulated in Washington, and as a man who was a paraplegic and couldn't easily get around the country the way that she could. Isaiah Berlin said that the great thing about Roosevelt was somehow that he had absorbed the hopes and the fears and the loves and the wants of the American people so fully that he could represent them as their leader. Well, that's intuition. Whatever makes a great politician, he had that. But I think he'd also be the first to admit that it was also the result of the remarkable ramblings of Eleanor Roosevelt around the country, bringing him back such shrewd understanding of what was happening that he was really made a larger person as a result of her partnership. But then, as the film clip suggests, when the war happened, she felt that this partnership that had been so important to both of them in the 30s was being destroyed because he was suddenly spending all of his time worrying about military matters, making his peace with business. As I know, Ken knows, when they brought those businessmen into government at that time, the liberals were appalled. What's going on with our New Deal government? He was spending more time with Southern conservatives, with generals. And Eleanor felt he no longer had time to worry about blacks, poor women, migrant workers, all the people that she cared about. And she really went into quite a serious decline of depression until she came out of it convinced that there was still an important role for her to play. And that was somehow to be a vehicle and to argue that the war had to be a vehicle for social reform. Now, that wasn't immediately what was on his mind. So it meant that she had to become an agitator, often working at cross purposes with him, often relentless, often pesty, so much so that half the time he didn't want to see her because he knew she'd be arguing against him. But I think in many ways, she was even more effective during the war years in making sure that by the end of the war, it was a more socially just country than she was in the Depression years when they both traveled along parallel lines. When I think about what she did in civil rights, I think in some ways during the war, it's one of the most affirming moments in the history of the home front. At the start of the war, as the white people got back to work in the factories, blacks were systematically discriminated against and were even worse off than they'd been in the Depression when everyone was out of a job. So the great civil rights leader A. Philip Randolph threatened to march on Washington, and Franklin asked Eleanor to negotiate with him. He agreed to call off the march only if Roosevelt would sign an order that would force companies to open their doors to blacks. Roosevelt finally agreed to do this. It was the Fair Employment Practice Commission. And as a result of the FEPC, almost 2 million blacks got jobs in the factories that they never would have had before. I was lucky enough to interview one of these men, William Barber, who became the first black motorman in the history of Philadelphia. And he told me that there were 10,000 whites. He was the first black. And he was so excited the first day he was going to go on the job that he got to the trolley station at 5.30 in the morning so he'd be sure to get there early. But there were no buses running, no trains. Nothing was going on. He didn't know what had happened. So he put the radio on, only to discover that the entire system of 10,000 whites had gone on strike because he was coming to work that day. So for four days, all of Philadelphia was shut down. No one could get to the war plants until finally Roosevelt took decisive action. He told all the striking workers in Philadelphia that if they were not back to work by Monday, they would all be drafted on Tuesday morning. <laughs> they came back to work on Monday. And William Barber became the first black motorman in Philadelphia's history. So too in the military, whereas at the start of the war, blacks were confined to the lowest level jobs. By the end, between the civil rights movement that was burgeoning and Eleanor's insistent agitation, blacks were serving in all levels of, as officers, as radio men, as gunmen, et cetera. And the beginning steps in desegregation, which would only be completed later by Truman, were taken during this period of time. Now, you can imagine how Eleanor being so far ahead on civil rights provoked criticism in the country at large. There were these wonderful rumors that would swirl about her. Southern white women believed that there was something called Eleanor Tuesdays whereby on Tuesday mornings, black women would come out on the street and knock a white woman down in honor of Eleanor, almost like a bounty. I got my woman. It wasn't true. It wasn't happening. But it was so widespread that white Southern women I've talked to wouldn't leave their homes on Tuesday morning. They would stay home because afraid, fearful of Eleanor Tuesdays. 
Roosevelt would get letters, can't you muzzle that wife of yours? Do you have lace on your panties for allowing her to speak out so much? And somehow he never stopped her. I mean, he let her keep going. I think inside his own conscience, she was articulating what he believed. He just had to worry more about the politics, so it was great to have her in front, pushing him further than he might have felt he could go at that time. Now, in addition to civil rights, she was critically important on women. It's interesting, at the start of the war, the factories were very reluctant to hire women. They were certain that the women would never be able to master the machines that were very complicated. They were sure if women came onto the assembly lines, the men would no longer work. They'd be whistling or flirting and wouldn't do anything on the work job. So even in 1941 and 42, when women were needed in the factories, factories were still conservative about letting them come into the workforce until finally Eleanor argued Finally, more importantly, perhaps, the men went off to war, so the factories had to hire women. And once they got on the jobs, it was incredible. They just did a fabulous job. In fact, all these studies show that the women were even more productive, more skillful in many ways than the men. So then one of my favorite moments in the research was they did a big study. How could this be so? How could these women have learned these complicated machines? The answer came back very simple. If a woman didn't know how to operate a particular piece of machinery, unlike her counterpart man, she would ask directions. <laughs> well. Any one of us who've ever driven anywhere <laughs> know exactly what that means. <laughs> anyway, once the women are on the jobs, Eleanor starts arguing for daycare for them. Very radical opinion at that time to be arguing for 24-hour day daycare. Nonetheless, many factories set it up, three shifts, and the women even got hot meals prepared for them. So when they went home at the end of the shift, they had a hot meal to bring to their family. Their laundry would be done while they were on the job. And there would be actually personal shoppers who would do their grocery training for them. So when they came back out of the job, they could focus on the job and go home to their family. I mean, sadly, as the war drew to a close, the women were not only cut out of the jobs, of course, the daycare centers were shut down. But I'm convinced that there was a kind of consciousness that was created in the minds of the women of what it meant to be independent, to feel that sense of mastery that was passed on to their daughters that later became the seed of the women's movement. Now, sadly, Eleanor was less successful in two areas. She wanted so much to keep the Japanese Americans out of the incarceration camps, and she couldn't do it. And she wanted to bring more Jewish refugees into the United States, and she was unable to do that. Where there was not a constituency for her to mobilize, her voice was less effective. And yet I discovered that because she so underplayed her role, she was actually so much more powerful than I had realized until I saw the flow of memos and letters between the two of them. It became clear, finally, how much she had actually done. In fact, she bombarded him with so many memos that he finally said to her, Eleanor, I can't read 30 memos a night from you. He finally made a deal. I'll put a basket by my bed. I'll call it the Eleanor basket. Three memos a night, Eleanor. I promise I will read them by morning. She sent so many memos to poor General Marshall in the War Department about desegregating the Army that he finally had to appoint a separate general just to deal with Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> but it all worked somehow. Her relentlessness carried the day. But in some ways, the story that so fascinated me was the human side of this partnership. Because Eleanor was traveling so much, somebody had to be there to take care of Roosevelt. And that role essentially fell to his secretary, Missy Lahand, who, as I say, was called by everyone around his other wife. She grew up here in Somerville. She started working for him when she was 20 years old, never married, and loved him really the rest of her life. She's the one who, if he had a cough, she would bring the cough medicine into the meeting. If he were grumpy during the day, she would arrange a poker game at night. Suddenly, his poker partners would appear, and it would relax him, and she would often be his partner. In fact, one of my favorite stories about poker has to do with Roosevelt had an annual poker game. And the rule was it was held on the night that the Congress was supposed to adjourn. The rule was whoever is winning, the moment the Speaker of the House calls to say we're adjourning, wins the poker game. Well, on one particular night, the story is told, Henry Morgenthau, his Secretary of the Treasury, is way, way ahead at 9.30 when the Speaker calls. And Roosevelt's way behind. So he just takes the phone and pretends it's somebody else. And he says, oh, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you now. I'm in the middle of a poker game. They keep playing. And finally, at midnight, Roosevelt is way ahead, and poor Morgenthau is way behind. So he asks an aide to bring him the telephone. Oh, Mr. Speaker, you're adjourning right now. That's fine. He rakes in all the chips. He wins all the money. Everything's great until the next morning when Morgenthau reads in the newspaper that the House had adjourned at 9.30. He was evidently so angry that he came in and resigned his cabinet post. Roosevelt had to charm him into staying, which of course he did. <laughs> and Missy would also be, be, in addition to being his partner at poker, she would be his hostess at the cocktail hour. He had this remarkable ability to unwind at the end of the day. So he had a cocktail hour where the rule was you couldn't talk politics. 
You could only tell funny stories. You could um, have gossip. You could talk about movies. Eleanor could never deal with this cocktail hour. I mean, she would come in and, of course, slum clearance would slip into the conversation or civil rights. But Missy would listen to Roosevelt's millionth tale that he told. Roosevelt had a habit, again, I think a common political habit, of telling stories that weren't quite true from his past. And again, when Eleanor would be there, she'd say, but Franklin, it didn't quite happen that way. <laughs> but Missy would just smile and nod happily at the same story being told a little skewed each time. In fact, a story I've told here so many times is my favorite story of this tendency of politicians to tell not quite true stories. When I first started working for Lyndon Johnson, I went with him to his ranch, and he had this great pool at the ranch that was filled with gadgets. He was a gadget freak, so it was filled with floating desks that came by with floating notepads on top of the desk. <laughs> floating trays would come by with floating, de floating plates and floating forks on the trays. Anyway, I'm swimming with him amidst all these floating items, and that day Hugh Sidey had written a column about a speech Johnson had given to the troops going to Vietnam. He's still president at this point, in which he said, great speech, only very patriotic, only one problem. He kept talking about a great-great-grandfather in the speech who had died at the Battle of the Alamo. And Johnson didn't have one who died at the Alamo. He must have wanted one so much, Sidey suggested, that he must have made him up. So I said to Johnson, how can you do this? How can you make him up? And he says, oh, these journalists, they're such sticklers for detail. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a feeling that Roosevelt did the same sort of thing, but Missy just looked and loved it. So too, Missy would choose the movies. He loved adventure movies. He loved mystery movies. When Eleanor would be there, it would, of course, be The Grapes of Wrath or a documentary on civil rights. But it was important for Roosevelt to be able to relax, and Missy provided that critical function. And then when he went to Hyde Park, his mother, Sarah, was still waiting at the door for him as she had waited when he came home from Groton, from Harvard. She had given him perhaps the most important asset a mother can give a child, that sense of unconditional love, though she had never let him go. And I imagine for Eleanor, both Missy in the White House and Sarah at Hyde Park provoked great moments of jealousy. But on the other hand, she knew that without these two women to care for him, she couldn't have been Eleanor Roosevelt out on the road traveling so much, so respected by women and men alike in her age. So she had come to accept the pattern. But then what happens in the middle of the war is this pattern that worked so well for so long is disrupted by two events. In 1941, Missy, who had suffered rheumatic fever when she was a child and been left with a somewhat weakened heart, has a catastrophic stroke, and she's never able to speak intelligibly again. And three months after her stroke, his mother, Sarah, dies. Now, what happened is the loss of these two women was so hard for him that he became so lonely that eventually, a couple months later, he turned to Eleanor, and he essentially asked her to be his wife again to stop traveling, to be his partner more even than his political partner, to be his companion. And it's one of those moments when as a biographer you want to reach back in time and say, Eleanor, just do it. I know he loves you and I know you love him and just stay home. He needs you right now. But on the other hand, understandably, Eleanor couldn't do it. She had gotten her whole sense of confidence from being on the road, from being Eleanor Ro Roosevelt, from representing all these people who needed her so badly. And I think she was so afraid of being hurt again if she allowed herself to be defined totally by Franklin Roosevelt. Similarly, she couldn't relax at the cocktail hour. Even when Churchill would come to the White House, she couldn't help but argue with him all the time about India and colonialism, about Franco and Spain. <laughs> but on the other hand, she somehow saw things that other people didn't see. There's one moment when she sees Churchill and Roosevelt in the map room that Roosevelt created in the White House. And she said, as she looked in sort of sadly, they were having so much fun in there, moving all the soldiers around, that they looked like two little boys playing soldier. And she had a feeling they were enjoying this adventure a little bit too much. So there's always that insight that she brings. But on the other hand, it wasn't easy for her to just relax. And she couldn't get her confidence from being in the White House. So gradually, she started traveling more and more. And as a result, she couldn't be there when he needed her, despite her trying to fulfill his pledge for a few periods, for a small period of time. So finally, in 1943, he was so lonely that he brought his eldest and only daughter, Anna, in to take care of him and really to be his hostess the way Missy LaHand had been when Eleanor was away. Eleanor was delighted at first because this is the only child she'd really been close to. She'd had a tough time with all four sons. And however, what happened is once Anna was there, she became her father's daughter. She was perfect for the role. She was tall. She was beautiful. She was long-legged. She loved cocktails. She didn't give him any memos. She loved adventure movies. She could gossip with him. She could play poker with him. And after a while, when Eleanor would come back from her trips, she began to feel a little displaced by her own daughter, who would know things that she didn't know. And then everything got more complicated in that last year of their lives, when Roosevelt was diagnosed in March of 44 with congestive heart failure.
and really in many ways he was dying that last year until April of 45. He was sent to Bernard Baruch's plantation to recuperate, and it was there essentially, he was there for a month, that he saw Lucy Mercer for the first time since 1918. He had kept in touch with her and seen her on a few official occasions between then and now, but she had married a very wealthy man named Winther Brutherford, who had just died in the spring of 44. And I'm convinced when he saw her at that moment that all that it meant for him was somehow it reminded him of what it was like when he was young before his polio. Remember that he had known her before he became a paraplegic and before his heart was now giving way to the heart disease. So he got a certain kind of comfort and solace from seeing her and decided he wanted to see her regularly. But the only way he could do that, because he never thought Eleanor would understand that it was simply a friendship at this time in his life, was to arrange her visits when Eleanor was away. And the only person he trusted with that delicate task was his daughter, Anna. You can imagine the dilemma that it put Anna in. She later said she felt caught in a crossfire and didn't know what to do. But she saw in a way that Eleanor didn't see that her father's health was failing. And she decided if this old friend could provide her father with some comfort and solace as he still faced D-Day and all the big battles of the war to come, it wasn't up to her to judge what he needed. So Anna arranged for Lucy to come to the White House about six times in that last year. And Lucy would stay about a week at a time, every night having dinner with Roosevelt. And often Anna would join them for dinner. Now I've traced where Eleanor was on those nights. And this is what makes it so complicated, because Eleanor was doing exactly what she wanted to be doing. She would be on the road celebrating with women when they won ease for excellence in the factories. She'd be with the civil rights leaders when the order desegregating the PXs in the army camps came down. And without the, again, without the kind of relaxation that he was provided by these other women, she couldn't have been who she was. And still, there was great affection between husband and wife. Shortly before he died, Roosevelt told his son Elliot that there was still no one in the world, no woman close to Eleanor, who was as intuitive, as remarkable, as brilliant, who he felt such love, respect, and affection for. He just wished that she had more time for him because she was so busy, which is true. You look at her schedule, it is incomprehensible that any woman could keep to what she did during the day. So I'm convinced that it all might have worked out with no one being hurt had it not been for the sad fact that Lucy happened to be at Warm Springs, Georgia at the moment when Roosevelt collapsed. She knew enough to leave as soon as he collapsed. He died an hour later. But later that night when Eleanor flew down to Warm Springs, she wanted to know everything that had happened as you would at the time of a death. And there was a spinster cousin there named Laura Delano who probably had always loved FDR and always been jealous of Eleanor. Because I believe when Eleanor asked her, tell me everything that happened, Laura Delano maliciously elected to tell her that Lucy had been there. And not only that, but that Lucy had been at the White House several times that last year, and that Anna, the daughter, had been the one to arrange that. I can't even imagine the dignity that Eleanor was able to muster that allowed her to go in that famous train ride where her husband's body was carried from Warm Springs, Georgia, back to Washington, and never let the world know what she was feeling inside. When she got to the White House, she confronted Anna, and all Anna could say was, I didn't know what to do. I just loved you so, both of you, so much. And Anna later said her mother was so angry and so cold that she was convinced that their relationship had been destroyed forever. But then what happened, and again, this is one of those moments when, as a biographer, you feel such awe for your subjects, not thinking you could ever have the largeness of spirit to do the same. In the summer of 45, after his death, Eleanor started traveling the country again. That's what gave her comfort in a certain sense. And everywhere she went, the people told her how much they loved Roosevelt. Taxi drivers, porters, elevator operators. And they told her how much better their lives were. She talked to blacks who've had a feeling of mastery from the factory jobs, courage from the military, to women who had a sense of camaraderie and pride in what they had done in the shipbuilding industry, where they formed 60% of the jobs or 50% in the airplane factories. She talked to workers who were going to college on the GI Bill of Rights for the first period of time. She saw unions were stronger than ever before, despite the alliance he had made with business. She had fought him on so many issues during the war that I think she had lost sight of the larger picture, that her dream that the war would be a vehicle for social reform had taken place. People had migrated from the south to the west to the north, affecting a redistribution of income, really, for the first time in a long time. The faces of all these people and the warmth in their voices as they spoke about her husband began to melt her anger. And somehow she was able to muster herself to forgive him. And then as she was able to do that, she was able, just, at the war, just as the war drew to a close, to go to her daughter Anna and forgive her as well, affording a reconciliation between the two women that really reestablished a close relationship that lasted for the rest of their lives. So in conclusion, as I look at this complex story, 
of the Roosevelt home front, I can only say that I feel empathy for all the people involved. I'm absolutely convinced that they never meant to hurt one another. They were simply trying to lead very complicated lives with the best possible mixture of love and affection and respect through work and friendship. In short, it is all too possible, as the media would do today, to look from the outside in and accuse Roosevelt of infidelity for resuming his relationship with Lucy Mercer in that last year of his life, for even, even perhaps to accuse him of harassment for his relationship with his secretary, Missy Lahand, and to accuse Anna of betrayal of her mother. And yet every one of those labels would totally miss the mark, in my judgment, of trying to understand these individuals and their complicated relationships. <coughs> I think in some ways that the task of an historian is to somehow avoid that tendency that is so prevalent today to expose, to stereotype, and label, and instead, if we can, to bring common sense and empathy and perspective to our subjects so that the past can truly come alive, even if just for a few moments, in all of its complexity. Thank you so very much. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Uh, and also possibly damaging, because you caused me to make a set of notes here <laughs> of reminiscence on various matters of the, that time. Uh, perhaps I might have just one minute. More than that. <laughs> I, uh, <Please. laughs> I particularly. Uh, noted your uh, statement that when FDR was very ill in 1944, uh, he went to Hubclaw. And uh, years later, Mrs. Roosevelt was doing a uh, series of television broadcasts at Brandeis. And we saw her here every week. This was in 1960. And she told me one day that I had to go to New York and see Bernard Baruch of Hopclaw, one of the most ostentatiously uh, present men <laughs> I've ever known, anybody has ever known. His capacity for promoting self-regard was unparalleled. And I must go and get some money from him for Kennedy, because until he was locked in with money, uh, he might not support Kennedy in the 1960 election. So I went to New York, went up, saw Bernie Baruch, got some money from him. There was, there was no danger, actually, because uh, uh, he, Nixon had already asked him to head a senior citizens committee for Nixon, and <laughs> outraged senior citizen. <laughs> So I came back with a considerable pride, told Mrs. R, as we called her, uh, about my success. Uh, Baruch was all set. She said, oh, Bernie, she said, you know, when my husband died at uh, Warm Springs, he came right over. He was at Hobclaw, and he came right over, and he stayed with us there at Warm Springs. And he came with us on that train you mentioned to Washington. And he was with us through the state funeral. And he came with us uh, on to Hyde Park, and he was with us through the family funeral. And there were several times, Kenneth, when I thought he was going to get into the coffin with Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, will, I will also reminded of my most uh, intimate uh, encounter with Franklin D. Roosevelt, which was in the January or early February of 1942, when it was evident that the Japanese were going south, that we would have no more natural rubber. It would be some months before the synthetic rubber came available, wonderful as that was. And I was in charge of price control and rationing and put in a very stern rationing system on rubber tires. Uh, 
you had to really have a position of absolute indispensability to get a rubber tire. And I listed, we listed the numbers, people, the kind of people who could get them. And this produced a wonderful uh, letter over from Roosevelt wanting to know what political idiot thought that ministers were not essential. <laughs> it, it, it had never occurred to me that they needed to have rubber tires. <laughs> Uh, it was a letter of considerable force. Uh, and the rationing system was expanded the next morning. <laughs> they, uh, I also, this is my last point, uh, remarked your, the a curious problem of which, uh, which you mentioned and which other historians have insufficiently mentioned. It was impossible to have this enormous mobilization without businessmen. Uh, on the other hand, the businessmen were the people who, with very few exceptions, had been attacking the New Deal, supporting Alf Land and Dewey et al., Wilkie, uh, were very most, well, not Dewey, he came later, uh, most enormously opposed to the New Deal. And this was a, an extraordinary problem. And it was one which those of us who called ourselves New Dealers were very much involved with. And I was very much involved with it uh, uh, in another regard because they all wanted, they were, they were there not only to mobilize the country, but they were there to defend the country against FDR. They had a, a bifocal view of the problem. And they also wanted more money. And I spent my mornings in those days at the end of a long table in my office. Uh, we had a hearing every day on somebody already making quite a lot of money wanting some more. Uh, steel, oil, on and on. The need for more return, to bring out the incentive effect for the war. And I would look down at the table and uh, see members of my staff going like this on the table. And I don't know whether you know what that means or not, but you will from now on. Uh, <laughs> it refers to an occasion in the ant country where there was an ant colony on the side of a very steep hill. And that was the year of the great famine in the ant country and there was no food. Until one day, a uh, sorte, came back to the ant colony saying a lovely piece of horse manure had been found up the hill from the ant colony. <laughs> and so the whole colony was mobilized out to bring back this wonderful, necessary food. And it started rolling more and more rapidly down the hill and it might go right beyond the ant colony. And so the queen ant put a first a battalion and then a division and then an army corps of her ants to hold against it. And she went up and down the lines with her antennae going like this, <laughs> uh, which in ant language means stop that horse shit. <laughs> um, um, well, uh, was the signal that I would see at my table <laughs> as we had pleas for more money from people who were already making more than they ever had in their life. Well, uh, there is a, a, there's a danger of these reminiscences getting out of hand, so uh, I, I had two, two, fur, two further very brief thoughts. Interrogating the high Nazis, one of the most interesting jobs I ever had, uh, at the end of World War II, uh, I was, we were told by Albert Speer, the uh, uh, head of German armaments, that one of the most disturbing things he ever saw was when he got his copy of Life magazine, which came through Lisbon, and saw those American factories uh, with all the women working in the factories, knowing that no German women were working in the factories at all. Uh, 
And the other thing, which uh, I mentioned before asking for your questions, uh, impressed me um, enormously about your book, Doris. I had not realized, uh, and Kitty, had, I think, had not realized, none of us had, even though we were close, how, what terrible physical condition this man was from 1944 on. He, we were, the country was led by a man of really, who was really dying, uh, and visibly so. Uh, he, this, uh, 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 there was a well-kept secret on his, uh, uh, on his uh, crutches, but there was also uh, a more dangerously kept secret, or a more right. uh, spectacularly kept secret, maybe it wasn't dangerous, maybe it was the thing that, that helped, of what terrible health, physical condition he was in. Am I right on that? Oh, absolutely. In fact, it's the other side of, I mean, one may be glad that the press didn't report every time he fell or didn't show him being carried 2,500 times and demean his dignity. On the other hand, one thinks about the fact that the American people should have known the state of his health at that time. I mean, one would hope that they still would have rathered a physically impaired Roosevelt to Dewey mm -hmm. at that time, but they should have known the choice they were having. And I think part of it was that Roosevelt had been through so much before that even though he saw himself failing, he kept thinking he'll get through it somehow. I mean, he'd gotten through the polio. Eleanor kept thinking, I've seen him through so much, he's going to get better. And instead of getting better and circling back, it just kept going down and down until he finally died. But it's an amazing thing that he was able to muster himself. I mean, the, there's an amo amazing moment in the fall of 44 when people are rumoring about his bad health. So he decides he has to show the country that somehow he's okay, and that's when he goes out and gives this remarkable series of speeches on a rainy day in New York that even a healthy man would have been tired at the end. And in the middle of all that, of course, he gives that famous phallus speech that we all remember, which just everybody said the champ is back. Evidently, the Republicans were complaining that he had um, brought a destroyer back to bring his little dog who had been left on the Aleutian Islands. And that was one of the rumors that Roosevelt just wasted money all the time. So he gives this incredible speech in the midst of his ill health, um, but he gets all wound up in it and he says, and those Republicans, I don't mind their attacks on me, I don't mind their attacks on Eleanor, I don't mind their attacks on my children, but then when they stoop so low as to attack my little dog Falla, they have gone too far. <laughs> then he describes how Falla is really a Scotty, so he cares a lot about expenses, and he's so embarrassed at the thought that he would have spent, a destroyer would have been dispatched at $8 million to save him, that he hasn't been the same dog since. <laughs> it was great. I, I heard that speech. Did you on the actually radio. hear it? Oh, it's God. Still, it's still, to me, the greatest of Roosevelt's speeches. Oh, the that, timing uh, of it was the, so the incredible. The timing was just so wonderful. Now we must uh, make way for the, uh, we must show a superficial aspect of democracy here. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm curious about how far you think the press should go today in discussing a president's health, uh, considering what we were just discussing in uh, Roosevelt's health in 1944. That should have been a campaign issue, especially who he was picking for vice president. But now, do we go too far with the regular checkups of the president? Is that, should that be pu public information, uh, the details of a, of a president's physical? Or do you, you know, over your years of looking at, at these issues, do you think there are reasonable guidelines for the press? That's a really good question. I'm not sure I've thought of what parts of the medical um, exam should be published. I mean, I, w my general thought is that in that case, I'd rather err on the side of too much disclosure rather than less disclosure. But in general, I have the feeling, not so much dealing with physical health, but dealing with everything else, that we've gone over a line where we know much too much about the private pasts of our presidents. I mean, I think about something's happened in our political culture. We see it when people go on the air and talk at will about what happened in their childhood, their dysfunctional families. Presidents seem to have fallen into that trap as well. I remember listening to President Clinton's acceptance speech at the Democratic Convention, and I know it was a popular speech, but when he started talking about his abusive stepfather and stepping in the middle of the battles between the father and the mother, and then when Vice President Gore talked about the near death of his child, and then the camera zoomed in on that poor kid, Kathleen Brown in California just started talking about suddenly the rape of her daughter. 
you get this feeling that when a politician's willing to expose their private family troubles in order to appeal to the country, that something's gone askew. I mean, there's no way one could ever imagine Roosevelt have talked for a moment about how he felt when his mother died. The only symbol we ever saw was the black mourning band that he wore around his arm. And when his secretary came upon him at one moment opening a box of mementos, which his mother had saved of his old report cards, his old letters, he nearly broke down and asked her to leave because he didn't want her to see him broken down that way. And somehow I think when we don't know everything, there's a mystery allowed to our politicians that I think is stripped away today. I don't think we really want to know the kind of details that get emerging. And I think about Jimmy Carter's hemorrhoids and all that stuff. I mean, I don't care about that. I don't want to know those things, I think. I don't know how you feel about that, but I think no. somewhere we've got to get that some degree of dignity back. I think so, although uh, there, we, we shouldn't go carry, worry about this too much. Uh, I, w I was not a strong supporter of Ronald Reagan. Uh, but but, but I, I had the feeling that his deficiencies on the whole were adequately explored by, by Reagan himself. Uh, that, and, they, and that the press uh, had very little to add. Do you agree with that? Actually, I think Reagan did a better job of maintaining. I thought you would defend Reagan. His huh? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> of maintaining his distance is all I was going to say. <laughs> You're next. Thank you. My name is Avery Gardner. I'm a sophomore at the college and a member of the Institute's Student Advisory Committee. And I'd like to ask you about the, the dignity of the presidential office, which you mentioned in your talk, um, and how Roosevelt was so very fortunate to have had that dignity, which allowed him to separate and distance his personal life, and, and the press respected his office in that position. What is it that has caused us to lose that dignity of the office, such that we now do see the president falling down the stairs or throwing up all of the prime minister of Japan's shoes? What, what was it, what transformation of our society has caused that change in our respect for the president's office? Oh, I mean, it's something I've thought about, and I'd love, love to hear Ken on it, too, and I'm not sure I fully know the answer. I mean, it seems like the combination of Vietnam, where the credibility of the president was understandably challenged, followed by Watergate, when the exposure of Watergate on the part of the reporters provided the most heroic example of what a reporter was, instead of being a white, at the time of Roosevelt, if you were a White House correspondent, providing information to the country about what the president was doing, which you knew from being sort of an insider, you were at the height of your profession. After Watergate, being an investigator, being an exposer became the height of the reporting profession. So I think the whole reporting profession changed in its attitude toward politics. I think the whole country has changed in the kind of respect it feels for the institutions of government, and not just because of the press, because I think government has lost respect in many ways by what it's done as well. And then on the other side, you have politicians who somehow feel, because of the saturation of television, that they're not alive unless they're on the evening press at night. I mean, Roosevelt was able to go on trips for on vacation. He would go to Hyde Park. The press would stay in an office, in a house nearby. They would not bother him. They wouldn't be at the windows. They would know if a crisis occurred, he would call them over. He went on a fishing trip for 10 days in the middle of England's bankruptcy crisis. And the press is on another boat, but they're not in little tugboats coming up to his. And as a result, in the solitude of those 10 days, he comes up with the brilliant idea of Lend-Lease. You need that kind of distance sometimes to replenish yourself. And it was on both parts, I think, we've gotten into a fatal dance on the part of the politicians craving publicity to be alive, and the press feeling no boundary between what's private and public. But I'd like to hear you. You've seen it. No, longer. I accept that. <laughs> so what do we do about it? <laughs> uh, I do have a question, but first, I'm Jim Tipton from Cambridge. And first, though, a couple of nostalgic additions. Oh, good. I was so pleased that you mentioned uh, A. Philip, that great gentleman, A. Philip Randolph, and the uh, Roosevelt's FEPC. I worked for FEPC in Atlanta. Ah. The first, I think, at least, uh, the first or second federal integrated office in Atlanta. But to Mrs. Roosevelt, I had the privilege in the uh, late uh, 40s and in the early 50s meeting her twice at small luncheons, once 
at the uh, Julius Rosenwald Fund office in Chicago. Uh, that great woman had a loveliness in her face that I couldn't but think of when you mentioned her hard life early on. I think also to mention uh, uh, which you, in the wartime, it came later, you wouldn't have mentioned, but uh, uh, Harry Truman's overcoming her resistance, becoming ambassador to the UN and the uh, Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, which we all should appreciate. Question, growing out of the young lady who preceded me, uh, and also suggested by Professor Galbraith's uh, comment one early on. I stood on Upper Broadway in uptown New York on that, in that freezing cold rain that you mentioned when the uh -huh. motorcade, Roosevelt motorcade, top down, bareheaded gentleman, and I knew I didn't know that he was really sick, as you said you didn't. But I knew he was in trouble, physically frail and all. Since 44, people, many people have said uh, a president campaigning, the candidate for the office, should be examined. And people who are potentially sick, as he was, should not be allowed to run. I'm curious about both of you. How would you feel about that in terms of a new you rule for Oh, you are. I don't know. You know, I mean, I think, um, I think it, what I would like to think is that Roosevelt's condition had been made known to the public. I think what was in Roosevelt's mind was somehow that he didn't feel it right to pull out of the presidency at the time of that fourth term while the war was still going on. He felt a responsibility to complete the job that he had so long struggled to complete. And in my own guess, he was imagining that at the time when the war ended, which was actually only a month or so, VE Day, and then three or four months later with VJ Day, my guess is he might have resigned at that point the presidency. Although once you've been president and you love it like Roosevelt did, it's really hard to give up. Churchill has my favorite quote about Roosevelt, just saying that he somehow loved the office so much, he had such an inner sense of elan and confidence that meeting Roosevelt sparkling as he was for the first time was like opening your first bottle of champagne. <laughs> and I love, Rose Churchill always knew what to say. But I, so I'm not sure that Roosevelt fully could have been able to give it up. But I still wish that in somehow, if the health had been made known, and he decided to go forward again, then the country would have had an honest judgment. They may still have chosen him, given what he represented to them, but at least it would have been a choice they had made with full knowledge, rather than, than the kind of rumored idea that he wasn't too well, but most people didn't realize how sick he was. I think you've got to go in for information in a democracy and hope that people respond somehow. Let me, let me in, carry that just one step further. There's been an enormous amount of discussion about the president's uh, position and health at Yalta. What's your mature, uh, full conclusion on that? Well, there's no question that he was physically exhausted when he's at Yalta. In fact, his daughter Anna went to Yalta with him. He brought Anna instead of Eleanor, knowing that Anna could help relax him. And she wrote letters to her husband during that period of time, who was in the war. And the letters reveal that she worried daily about his stamina, worried about his ticker, his old heart, as she called it. And yet, on the other hand, when you read the memoirs of all the people who were at Yalta, it's clear that he's participating in the conversations, that his mind is sharp, and that he is a full, um, as much as he can be, a member of the dialogue that's going on. I think what brought about the idea that this sick man at Yalta gave away Eastern Europe was that people, understandably, were sad about the consequences of the end of the war, and Roosevelt was dealing with realities at Yalta, which was that the Soviet Union had marched into Eastern Europe, a country in the American country was not ready to go to war to defend that, and the kind of bargains that he made at Yalta were broken later by Stalin. And I don't think we can fully blame Roosevelt for what happened after his death in the Eastern Europe sector. He may well have changed, he may well have done something differently. Mm -hmm. And I don't think it was because he was mentally impaired. Surely if he had been stronger and if he'd been at the top of his form, maybe he could have wrung a few more concessions out of Stalin. But Stalin had a great bargaining hand because of his position in the war at that time and the fact that the American people were not willing to fight any further. I'm on, I'm on. A, a lot of that is blamed back on Yalta was really Churchill's con separate concession as far as Eastern Europe was concerned and that famous uh, uh, mathematical calculation. That's right. Uh, to some extent that is traced loosely to Yalta, but actually is a wholly separate uh, uh, discussion. Right. Please. 
Um, we've done a lot of talking about the media digging too deep today, that the, we learned too many things. But does that, uh, as you as a biographer, go back and dig through information about FDR, does that present you with some dilemmas on what do you expose, what do you not expose? And does your editor always agree with you? <laughs> I mean, that's a very fair question. I mean, I think in some ways, the first book I did on Lyndon Johnson was the hardest one to figure out what I had the right to expose and what I didn't, because so much of the information that I got from him came from these from early morning, information from, from Lyndon Johnson. Mm -hmm. um, on this biography, I, I had less worries about it, because what I found out, I found out as an historian, like everybody else, digging through the facts. And it's 50 years after the fact. With Lyndon Johnson, I was writing actually during his lifetime and shortly after his death. And so much of what he had shared with me, he shared with me because he was so lonely and so sad at the end of his life. And I was aware that he probably wouldn't have told me so many intimate things about his mother and his past if it had been that he was still in the presidency. It was because he was lonely and I was there. And in some ways, because he had you know, whatever strange relationship we had, where somehow he ended up thinking that I reminded him of his mother, <laughs> that he talked to me about all these things. When I sat down to write that biography, I really had to think, is this my information? Is it fair? Why did he tell it to me? Some, to some extent with the Kennedys, there was certain uh, one moment when Rose Kennedy revealed to me in a stunning moment that her daughter, Rosemary, had had a lobotomy performed at Joe Kennedy's hands. And I hadn't known that before. It just sort of came out of Rose. Those are the hard moments as a biographer when you figure out, is this truly something that emerged from a formal interview, or did it just come out, and what's fair and not fair? Did, did you record all those com conversations with uh, uh, LBJ, or did, the, did you have to cook? Interesting question. I mean, what would happen is Lyndon Johnson thought every word he said was so important that he would be mad if you didn't write down what he was saying. Yeah. I mean, for example, what would happen is that he would be telling me something I thought so so painful about the fact that when he was a little kid, his mother loved him desperately, but if he didn't do well in school, she would pretend that he had died at the end of the day. And at the dinner table, she would, she would say to her husband or his younger brother, isn't it too bad Lyndon's no longer with us? I found this so painful that I didn't take notes on it. And he'd look over saying, why aren't you taking notes? This could be important someday. But then, but then at another moment, he'd be telling me some gossip about Wilbur Mills. In fact, I mean, he knew, Johnson knew everything that was going on in Washington. We all know that later, Wilbur Mills got exposed in the reflecting pool with Fanny Fox, the stripper. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson was saying, you know, that man, Wilbur Mills, he's going to be caught with his pants down someday. And I'm writing all this down. He says, don't write that down. No. <laughs> so it was hard to get the signals from him. <laughs> I have a, where, there's, a, there's a tendency for reminiscence to get out of hand. No. But, that's <laughs> uh, they, <clears throat> one of the most uh, compelling problems I had when I was price czar was uh, were Texas oil prices, and particularly the independent uh, oil producers, who were then headed by a man by the name of Bernard Majewski. Some years later, I was, but when Johnson was vice president, we're the same age, we're up to Vietnam, very good friends. I was back from India chatting with LBJ, and I, we were making conversation. I said, what was it like to be a uh, senator from Texas and have to do business with Bernard Majewski? I said, no, Bernard Majewski? I said, yes. He said, you know, he came into my office one day. He said, Senator, you've got a tough race coming up. <clears throat> if you can do <clears throat> as you should do on <clears throat> depletion allowances and a few other things we need, we can come up with $10,000 for you. I said, you can't come into the office of the United States, United States Senator and talk that way. I said, he said, never budged. He said, look, he said, you got the experience, you got the position, we can make it 50. <laughs> uh, I, I said, I gave that man a real bawling out. I said, I really talked with him. Uh, uh, never budged. He said, uh, you've got the experience. Uh, You've got what we need. Uh, you need the money. We can come up with a hundred, hundred, hundred thousand, <laughs> hundred grand. <clears throat> LBJ said, "Do you know what I did, Ken?" Said I called in Walter Jenkins. I took one arm, Walter took the other, and I marched that fellow right out of my office. And I said, "You stay out of here, you bastard, because you're getting awful close to my price." <laughs> 
was a great. Uh, he was a great character. Short question. <laughs> I'm Shalom, social scientist, interest in history. Uh, my question is about to misappropriate the phrase from Henry James, the moral center of FDR. Uh, about quarter century ago, Kitty Genovese was stabbed to death over half an hour or 40 minutes, where 38 or 37 people were watching and nobody picked up the phone, did something. Uh, during the times of FDR, six million human beings were murdered, one and a half or one million of them children, about every hour, about 4,000, 1,000 children and babies. And I'm wondering about the moral center of a person who is admir admirable. How does one stand by and watch and not move a hand, a finger, do nothing? When he acted, as you describe in your book and today, he could act. He was the man who chose Truman, but the buck stopped there. Breckenridge Long and all this was not the boss. Could you explain the moral center of that person? It's a very, very fair question, and it's one that's troubled me throughout the whole writing of this book. I mean, here is in some ways the greatest humanitarian of the 20th century, and he failed utterly on one of the more significant issues that came his way, although it didn't come quite to, for decision in the way that one might think after the fact. The first place where perhaps, and I, I wish he could have done more, was before Hitler prevented the refugees from, from leaving Germany, leaving Eastern Europe, the United States did not open its doors in anywhere near the numbers that it could have to let them in. I mean, it's true, those people who apologize for Roosevelt point out correctly that the U.S. took more refugees in in 38, 39 than all the other countries combined. They point out that there was anti-Semitism in the country, which there was. They point out that Breckenridge Long was in the State Department and he was an anti-Semite, which he was. But as Eleanor kept arguing with Franklin, all of that with a lot of push could have been changed and opened. And there's one famous conversation that Eleanor had with, with Franklin, because Breckenridge Long had been in charge of the visas. He was deliberately keeping the Jewish people out of the country. And he had been an old friend of Franklin's. And Eleanor says, you know, your friend Breckenridge Long is a fascist, Franklin. And he got so angry with her for using that term about an old friend. He said, I never want you to say that again. At which point Eleanor said, well, I may never say it again, but he still is a fascist. And she was absolutely right about that. Um, but on the other hand, and then once the war started, there's all sorts of controversy about whether or not he could have bombed the train tracks more, whether he could have bombed Auschwitz itself. The only thing that I think needs to be fairly understood for Roosevelt is that like the rest of the country, though he had privy to more information than most people did and was aware that something terrible was going on in Europe, I don't think anyone fully absorbed the magnitude of what was happening in Europe at that time, including Roosevelt. And I don't think it was the lack of a moral center on his part, but rather an absolute obsession with the idea that winning the war was the primary way to help everybody, including the Jews of Europe. He was skewed in that thinking. I think he thought if the war could get over more quickly, that would save the situation. Obviously, we now know after the fact that the Jews were doomed at that point in time. He did not know that when he was making those decisions. So it's a pretty complicated thing, but I have no problem criticizing and wishing that this man who was a great leader had done more and should have done more at that period of time. Let me just I'd add one, to one footnote on that. to that. Uh, this, um, uh, this question of bombing the railway tracks into Auschwitz has really got out of hand. The Norden bomb site, which we had at that time, was accurate within about a quarter of a mile. And the railway track is that wide. Mm. Uh, but if by accident we did hit it, uh, the Germans had by this time uh, trains equipped with uh, uh, bulldozers, equipped with rails, to move in to correct a uh, uh, bombing of a track if it happened to hit within about an hour, right. uh, maybe, have, maybe right. less than that. So that the cliché that we could have uh, saved this situation by bombing uh, the uh, railroads, leaving aside what happened to those terrible trains uh, that would just be, would be held up, is something which uh, has long needed correction. I think there's something in addition to that, too, which I've just recently learned more about. There's also been the charge that it was brought to McCloy for decision as to whether Auschwitz itself could have been bombed. Mm 
And it is true that somebody, whose name I don't remember now, sent on a recommendation from some other people that perhaps Auschwitz could be bombed, but added his own recommendation that most of the Jewish leaders at that time did not think it could be done or should be done, and that the first people to die would be the Jews. And then Hitler could argue, you see, the allies are killing the Jews <laughs> yes, themselves. And there's a famous photo that some people have pointed to where they, in a reconnaissance mission at the Farben plant, actually caught sight of Auschwitz. And you could see that it was a death camp. But I've now heard that that photo was not understood at the time, that that's what it was. We now understand what it is later, but they didn't have that intelligence mm -hmm. in front of them at that they time. Have very short but, but, uh, I know what the photo is, but... No, very, very short factual follow-up, just for a minute, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Because I talked just a few years ago with an Irish Catholic, Boston-born pilot who bombed industries very close to Auschwitz. He had bombs to spare. Oh, he could have oh. bombed Auschwitz if he was so ordered. And I talked to Karski, who you make mentioned... Making a question. Yeah. Karski, I'm asking you, when you said he didn't really know, given that Karski spent an hour he was in a desk camp. He gave him a report. How can you say he did Let me just ask this, and then we'll go on to another subject. Mm. But Karski, I talked to myself and interviewed, and it is true that he had seen the death camps himself. He had talked to Roosevelt and apprised him of what was going on in the summer of 42, 43. On the other hand, when I asked John Karski himself to evaluate Roosevelt's failure, I said, well, how do you explain Roosevelt's failure? He said, I'm not going to talk about it in those terms. This man was fighting a war that had to be fought. His attention had to be on winning the Allied cause. And surprisingly to me, he was unwilling to condemn Roosevelt for the very thing that I thought he would be, of more, more than anyone, be more articulate about, because he saw it in the larger framework of what Roosevelt was doing at that time. Any other questions? Were you? No more questions? They. I think somebody's pointing there. So. Oh. Good evening. My name is Adrienne Marks, and I'm a first-year student here at the Kennedy School. My question addresses the position and power of the First Lady, specifically the parallels often drawn between Eleanor Roosevelt and Hillary Clinton. Uh, many claim that the current First Lady is indeed the most influential and most powerful since Mrs. Roosevelt, yet many still remain highly critical of her involvement with policymaking. I would like to know how you think in 50 years when the next Doris Kearns Goodwin writes the biography of the Clinton presidency, <laughs> how will history portray Hillary Clinton? Oh, you know, it's interesting. I mean, throughout the last couple of months as um, the book has come out, the, inevitably the comparisons have been raised again and again about Hillary and Eleanor. And in part, I think, because Hillary Clinton takes a great deal of solace from Eleanor's story. Um, both she and President Clinton have read my book. And one fun, fun thing that happened is that one radio program, I was in Washington on this Diane Rehm show talking about the comparisons between Hillary and Eleanor. And after the show was over, Hillary Clinton, who had been listening to it, called me at the radio program. And she said, I had mentioned on the show how I just wanted to see what that second floor of the White House looked like. I had seen it when I was 23 years old, working for Lyndon Johnson. But like a stupid 23-year-old, had never asked, where did Franklin sleep? Where did Eleanor sleep? Where did I didn't even know who Lorena Hickok was. And that's all I wanted to do was see it once. So she invited my husband and me to come and sleep overnight, which we did last week in the White House. And we wandered the corridors between midnight and 1.30 and figured out where everyone had slept 50 years ago. It was great. Great fun. I mean, where Lorena Hickox left is now a kitchen for the Clintons. Eleanor's sitting room is now the, the Clintons' bedroom. FDR's oval study is still intact. We got to stay in Churchill's bedroom, so it was really exciting. But anyway, that's not the answer to your question. I think, in some ways, that when Hillary first came in, there was such expectation because she represented the first woman who promised, as part of the women's movement, to be a totally independent voice in her own right and to bring to the First Ladyship a real sophisticated background in public policy affairs. And as a result, everything she did seemed as if it were almost the first time it had been done, when she went to testify before the hearings on the Hill, when she gave a press conference, et cetera. I mean, she knew, and eventually the country knows, that it, it really had been 50 years of more ceremonial First Ladies between Eleanor and Hillary. And in some ways, I think what happens, what saddens me, is that there seems to be even more anger toward Hillary's assertion of independence than there was toward Eleanor. And the only way I can understand that is that, in some ways, Eleanor wasn't threatening because she was so far ahead of her time. Men didn't wake up in the morning and worry that their wives were suddenly going to become Eleanor Roosevelt, whereas Hillary represents, for good and ill, all the changes that have taken place in the society at large. 
And as a result of that, um, she's scary to certain elements of the society. There's a backlash against Clinton. They get at her for it. She took on one of the most controversial issues in the country on health care. I think she made her own share of mistakes. I, I think having a secret task force was disastrous. Lyndon Johnson would have told her, you know, if you want something to pass the Congress, you put everybody that you got to get to pass it on that task force. You get the senators, the congressmen, the interest group guys. If they're not with you on the takeoff, they won't be with you on the landing. But nonetheless, the anger toward her is disproportionate to the fact that this woman has tried to do, in many ways, I think, many important things for this country. And I can only explain that anger by the fact that there's still a lot of uncertainty in the country at large about women in general. And she's getting the brunt of that. On the other hand, I think she's also got an enormous wellspring of support from women who are modern women and seeing the country moving forward. I've heard of women who bring their daughters to see her because they want to see a role model like Hillary Clinton. So I think there's still chance in these next couple years or whatever happens for Clinton. I think Hillary represents more the way first ladies are going to be in the future. They're going to be more like Hillary than like Barbara Bush. So the country better get used to it. <laughs> and I think it's good that the country has it to get used to. I've just got a note. Sadly, that the evening must <laughs> come to an end. Uh, I would like to ask one question which, to which you could give a yes or no answer. <laughs> uh, sometime, as you hope and as I hope, we will elect a woman president. Uh, would it be good for her to have a husband like Eleanor Roosevelt? <laughs> I can only say yes. <laughs> Good job. <laughs>